Sir Robert Alexander Watson Watt, was a Scottish pioneer of radar technology. Radar was initially nameless and researched elsewhere but it was significantly developed in February 1935 when Watson Watt demonstrated the first practical radio system for detecting aircraft when he successfully bounced a radio wave from a BBC shortwave transmitter off a Handley Page Hayford aircraft. Having proved radar detection technology could work and received a patent for his system, on September 1, 1936 Watson Watt became superintendent of a new establishment under the Air Ministry. Bodsey Research Station near Felixto, Suffolk. Work there resulted in the design and installation of aircraft detection and tracking stations called Chain Home along the east and south coasts of England in time for the outbreak of the Second World War in 1939. This system provided the vital advance information that helped the Royal Air Force win the Battle of Britain. After the success of his invention, Watson Watt was sent to the U.S. in 1941 to advise on air defense after Japan's attack on Pearl Harbor. He was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society in 1941, was given a knighthood in 1942 and was awarded the U.S. Medal for Merit in 1946. Early Years Born in Brechin, Angus, Scotland, on April 13, 1892 Watson Watt, the hyphenated name is used herein for consistency, although he did not adopt it until 1942, was a descendant of James Watt, the famous engineer and inventor of the practical steam engine. After attending Damaker Primary School and Brechin High School, he was accepted to University College, Dundee, then part of the University of St Andrews but became the University of Dundee in 1967. Watson Watt had a successful time as a student, winning the Carnelli Prize for Chemistry and a class medal for Ordinary Natural Philosophy in 1910. He graduated with a B.Sc. in Engineering in 1912, and was offered an assistantship by Professor William Petty, the holder of the Chair of Physics at University College, Dundee from 1907 to 1942. It was Petty who encouraged Watson Watt to study radio, or wireless telegraphy as it was then known and who took him through what was effectively a postgraduate class of one on the physics of radio frequency oscillators and wave propagation. At the start of the Great War Watson Watt was working as an assistant in the college's engineering department. Early Experiments In 1916 Watson Watt wanted a job with the War Office, but nothing obvious was available in communications. Instead he joined the Meteorological Office which was interested in his ideas on the use of radio for the detection of thunderstorms. Lightning gives off a radio signal as it ionizes the air, and his goal was to detect this signal to warn pilots of approaching thunderstorms. The signal occurs across a wide range of frequencies, and could be easily detected and amplified by naval longwave sets, in fact, lightning was a major problem for communications at these common wavelengths. His early experiments were successful in detecting the signal and he quickly proved to be able to do so at ranges up to 2,500 km. However, there was some difficulty in determining location. This was accomplished by rotating a loop antenna to maximize, or minimize, the signal, thus pointing to the storm. However, the strikes were so fleeting that it was very difficult to turn the antenna in time to positively locate one. Instead, the operator would listen to many strikes and develop a rough average location. At first, he worked at the wireless station of Air Ministry Meteorological Office in Aldershot, Hampshire. In 1924 when the War Department gave notice that they wished to reoccupy their Aldershot site, he moved to Didden Park near Slough, Berkshire. The National Physical Laboratory, NPL, was already using this site and had two main devices that would prove pivotal to his work. The first was an adcock antenna, an arrangement of four masts that allowed the signal to be directed through phase differences. Using these as two separate loop antennas at right angles, one could make a simultaneous measurement of the lightning's direction in two axes. However, displaying the fleeting signals was a problem. This was solved by the second device, the Wii 224 oscilloscope, recently acquired from Bell Labs. By feeding the signals from the two antennas into the X and Y channels of the oscilloscope, a single strike caused the appearance of a line on the display, indicating the direction of the strike. 
the scope's relatively slow phosphor allowed the signal to be read long after the strike had occurred. Watt's new system was being used in 1926 and was the topic of an extensive paper by Watt and Hurd. The MET and NPL radio teams were amalgamated in 1927 to form the radio research station with Watt as director. Continuing research throughout, the teams had become interested in the causes of static radio signals, and found that much could be explained by distant signals located over the horizon being reflected off the upper atmosphere. This was the first direct indication of the reality of the heaviside layer, proposed earlier but at this time largely dismissed by engineers. To determine the altitude of the layer, Watt, Appleton, and others developed the Squager to develop a time-based display, which would cause the oscilloscope's dot to move smoothly across the display at very high speed. By timing the Squager so that the dot arrived at the far end of the display at the same time as expected signals reflected off the heaviside layer, the altitude of the layer could be determined. This time-based circuit was key to the development of radar. After a further reorganization in 1933, Watt became superintendent of the radio department of NPL in Teddington. Radar The air defense problem During the First World War, the Germans had used Zeppelins as long-range bombers over London and other cities and defenses had struggled to counter the threat. Since that time aircraft capabilities had improved considerably and the prospect of widespread aerial bombardment of civilian areas was causing the government anxiety. Heavy bombers were now able to approach at altitudes that anti-aircraft guns of the day were unable to reach. With enemy airfields across the English Channel potentially only 20 minutes flying time away, bombers would have dropped their bombs and be returning to base before any intercepting fighters could get to altitude. The only answer seemed to be to have standing patrols of fighters in the air at all times but, with the limited cruising time of a fighter, this would require a huge air force. An alternative solution was urgently needed and in 1934, the Air Ministry set up a committee, the CSAD, Committee for the Scientific Survey of Air Defence, chaired by Sir Henry Tizard to find ways to improve air defence in the UK. Nazi Germany was rumoured to have a death ray using radio waves that was capable of destroying towns, cities, and people. In January 1935, Harry Wimp Harris, Director of Scientific Research at the Air Ministry, asked Watson Watt about the possibility of building their version of a death ray, specifically to be used against aircraft. Watson Watt quickly returned a calculation carried out by his young colleague, Arnold Wilkins showing that the device was impossible to construct, and fears of a Nazi version soon vanished. However, he also mentioned in the same report a suggestion that was originally made to him by Wilkins, who had recently heard of aircraft disturbing shortwave communications, that radio waves may be capable of detecting aircraft, meanwhile attention is being turned to the still difficult, but less unpromising, problem of radio detection and numerical considerations on the method of detection by reflected radio waves will be submitted when required. Wilson's idea, checked by Watt, was promptly presented by Dizard to the CSAD on January 28. Aircraft Detection and Location On February 12, 1935, Watson Watt sent the secret memo of the proposed system to the Air Ministry, Detection and Location of Aircraft by Radio Methods. Although not as exciting as a death ray, the concept clearly had potential but the Air Ministry, before giving funding, asked for a demonstration proving that radio waves could be reflected by an aircraft. This was ready by February 26 and consisted of two receiving antennas located about away from one of the BBC's shortwave broadcast stations at Daventry. The two antennas were phased such that signals travelling directly from the station cancelled themselves out but signals arriving from other angles were admitted, thereby deflecting the trace on a CRT indicator, passive radar. Such was the secrecy of this test that only three people witnessed it, Watson Watt, his colleague Arnold Wilkins, and a single member of the committee, A.P. Rowe. The demonstration was a success, on several occasions a clear signal was seen from a Handley Page Hayford bomber being flown around the site. Most importantly, the Prime Minister, Stanley Baldwin, was kept quietly informed of radar's progress. On April 2, 1935, Watson Watt received a patent on a radio device for detecting and locating an aircraft. In mid-May 1935, 
Wilkins left the radio research station with a small party, including Edward George Bowen, to start further research at Orford Ness, an isolated peninsula on the Suffolk coast of the North Sea. By June they were detecting aircraft at a distance of, which was enough for scientists and engineers to stop all work on competing sound-based detection systems. By the end of the year the range was up to, at which point plans were made in December to set up five stations covering the approaches to London. One of these stations was to be located on the coast near Orford Ness, and Bodsey Manor was selected to become the main centre for all radar research. In an effort to put a radar defence in place as quickly as possible, Watson Watt and his team created devices using existing available components, rather than creating new components for the project, and the team did not take additional time to refine and improve the devices. So long as the prototype radars were in workable condition they were put into production. They soon conducted full-scale tests of a fixed radar radio tower system that would soon be known as Chain Home an early detection system that attempted to detect an incoming bomber by radio signals. The tests were a complete failure, with the fighter only seeing the bomber after it had passed its target. The problem was not the radar, but the flow of information from trackers from the observer corps to the fighters, which took many steps and was very slow. Henry Tizard with Patrick Blackett and Hugh Dowding immediately set to work on this problem, designing a command and control air defense reporting system with several layers of reporting that were eventually sent to a single large room for mapping. Observers watching the maps would then tell the fighter groups what to do via direct communications. By 1937 the first three stations were ready, and the associated system was put to the test. The results were encouraging, and an immediate order by the government to commission an additional 17 stations was given resulting in a chain of fixed radar towers along the east and south coast of England. Why the start of the Second World War, 19 were ready to play a key part in the Battle of Britain, and by the end of the war over 50 had been built. The Germans were aware of the construction of Chain Home but were not sure of its purpose. They tested their theories with a flight of the Zeppelin LZ-130, but concluded the stations were a new long-range naval communications system. As early as 1936, it was realized that the Luftwaffe would turn to night bombing if the day campaign did not go well, and Watson Watt had put another of the staff from the radio research station, Edward Bowen, in charge of developing a radar that could be carried by a fighter. Nighttime visual detection of a bomber was good to about 300m, and the existing chain home system simply did not have the accuracy needed to get the fighters that close. Bowen decided that an airborne radar should not exceed 90 kilograms, 200 pounds, in weight, 8 feet superscript 3, 230 L, in volume, and require no more than 500 watts of power. To reduce the drag of the antennas the operating wavelength could not be much greater than 1 M, difficult for the day's electronics. AI, airborne interception, was perfected by 1940 and was instrumental in eventually ending the Blitz of 1941. Watson Watt justified his choice of a non-optimal frequency for his radar with his often quoted cult of the imperfect, which he stated as give them the third best to go on with, the second best comes too late, and the best never comes. Civil Service Trade Union Activities Between 1934 and 1936, Watson Watt was president of the Institution of Professional Civil Servants, now a part of Prospect, the Union for Professionals. The union speculates that at this time he was involved in campaigning for an improvement in pay for Air Ministry staff. Contribution to Second World War In his English History 1914-1945 historian A.J.P. Taylor paid the highest of praise to Watson Watt, Sir Henry Tizard and their associates who developed and put in place radar crediting them with being fundamental to victory in the Second World War. In July 1938 Watson Watt left Bodsey Manor and took up the post of Director of Communications Development, D.C. DeRay. In 1939 Sir George Lee took over the job of D.C.D., and Watson Watt became Scientific Advisor on Telecommunications, SAT, to the Ministry of Aircraft Production, traveling to the U.S. in 1941 to advise them on the severe inadequacies of their air defense illustrated by the Pearl Harbor attack. 
He was knighted by George VI in 1942 and received the U.S. Medal for Merit in 1946. Ten years after his knighthood, Watson Watt was awarded £50,000 by the UK government for his contributions in the development of radar. He established a practice as a consulting engineer. In the 1950s he moved to Canada and later he lived in the US, where he published Three Steps to Victory in 1958. Around 1958 he appeared as a mystery challenger on the American television program To Tell the Truth. Watson Watt reportedly was pulled over for speeding in Canada by a radar gun-toting policeman. His remark was, had I known what you were going to do with it I would never have invented it. He wrote an ironic poem, Rough Justice, afterwards. Pity Sir Robert Watson Watt. Strange target of this radar plot. And thus, with others I can mention. The victim of his own invention. His magical all-seeing eye. Enabled cloud-bound planes to fly. But now by some ironic twist. It spots the speeding motorist. And bites, no doubt with legal wit. The hand that once created it. Legacy. On September 3, 2014 a statue of Sir Robert Watson Watt was unveiled in Brechin by HRH the Princess Royal. On September 4 Watson Watt featured in the BBC Two drama Castles in the Sky, with Eddie Izzard in the role. Reviewing the film The Daily Telegraph concluded, overall, it all felt a bit worthy. This was history that everybody should know, but the erection of a statue might have done the job just as well. A collection of some of the correspondence and papers of Watson Watt is held by the National Library of Scotland. A collection of papers relating to Watson Watt is also held by archive services at the University of Dundee. Family Life Watson Watt was married on July 20, 1916 in Hammersmith, London to Margaret Robertson, the daughter of a draftsman, they later divorced and he remarried in 1952 in Canada. His second wife was Jean Wilkinson, who died in 1964. He returned to Scotland in the 1960s. In 1966, at the age of 74, he proposed to Dame Catherine Trafusis Forbes, who was 67 years old at the time and had also played a significant role in the Battle of Britain as the founding air commander of the Women's Auxiliary Air Force, which supplied the radar room operatives. They lived together in London in the winter, and at the observatory Trafusis Forbes summer home in Pitlochry, Perthshire, during the warmer months. They remained together until her death in 1971. Watson Watt died in 1973, aged 81, in Inverness. Both are buried in the churchyard of the Episcopal Church of the Holy Trinity at Pitlochry.